two of a four part lecture on thematic analysis. This part will focus on the idea that thematic analysis is uniquely flexible compared to other qualitative analytic approaches. Do feel free to skip through these intro slides if you've heard this all before. These materials are the result of a collaboration between Virginia or Ginny Brown on the left, myself, Victoria Clark in the middle, and Nikki Hayfield on the right. And the lectures will be narrated either by myself or Nikki. And as I'm talking now, you can tell that I will be narrating this lecture. So to give you an overview of the topic of this lecture, we will be exploring some of the key features of thematic analysis and particularly the Brown and Clark approach to reflexive thematic analysis. We'll be exploring how to undertake a reflexive thematic analysis with a particular focus on processes of coding and theme generation. And we'll also be considering what counts as a high quality thematic analysis and how you avoid common problems that we often see in both published research and student work. Throughout the lectures, there are some alerts to highlight key points, and there will also be opportunities to pause the recording and engage in some guided study activities to help you develop your understanding of thematic analysis. To give you a brief overview of the four parts of the lecture, in part one, we explored what is thematic analysis. In part two, we're going to explore the idea that thematic analysis is uniquely flexible. Part three will focus on the six phases of reflexive thematic analysis, so the doing process. And then in part four, we'll discuss what counts as quality practice and how to avoid common problems. The central theme we're going to explore in this lecture is that thematic analysis is uniquely flexible. So in part one, I discussed the fact that unlike most other analytic approaches, TA is closer to a method rather than a methodology. This means that it isn't tied to a particular theoretical framework. But reflexive TA is tied to a qualitative paradigm. So when we start to work with particular iterations of TA, there are some research values that shape the procedures. But nonetheless, we can view reflexive TA in particular as very flexible when it comes to theory, and the conceptualization of the research process. And reflexive TA can be conducted in a number of different ways. It can be more inductive, so grounded in the data, or it can be more deductive or theory driven, where theory provides a lens for interpreting the data. We can use TA in a more experiential orientation to qualitative data or a more critical orientation. If these terms are unfamiliar, you might want to go back to the foundations of qualitative research lectures to help you um, make sense of this terminology. And TA can also be informed by a critical realist, contextualist or constructionist theoretical perspective. So when you're using TA, your job is to make a series of active choices about how you're going to use TA. So this is where the builder bear element comes in that I refer to in part one, that you need to decide how you're going to build your bear. You haven't gone into a toy shop and purchased a beautifully made bear where a designer has made all the choices for you. You have to decide how you're going to build your bear. And you need to be able to understand and explain why you're using TA in a particular way. So you need a rationale for your inductive approach, if that's the approach you take, your experiential orientation, your critical realist ontology, and so on. So we refer to this as conceptual and design thinking, that the TA researcher has to engage in active processes of conceptual and design thinking to use TA well and effectively. So a common myth we encounter is that TA is atheoretical, there's no theory in TA, or that it's inherently realist. Neither of these are true. TA is best understood as a theoretically flexible approach with different possibilities for how theory informs the practice of TA. So let's consider a bit more the conceptual and design flexibility that TA offers us. And here we have someone doing a yoga pose to denote flexibility. So different versions of TA can include contextualist approaches and contextualist TA can encompass phenomenological approaches, critical realism. TA can also be constructionist and have some elements in common with 
um, discourse analytic approaches. Some people use the term thematic discourse analysis to describe their approach. Mashups of TA and other approaches are increasingly common. So we see mashups of TA and narrative analysis. So developing themes, but also looking at narrative structures within data and various different mashups of TA and discourse analysis and also using TA in case study research. When it comes to data types, TA can be used to analyze most types of qualitative data from very conventional methods like interviews and focus groups to more innovative methods like qualitative surveys and story completion, but also diaries, a whole variety of secondary sources, media data, online forum comments and so on, and also data generated by visual and creative methods and their approaches to using TA to analyze images that are being developed. So TA is hugely flexible when it comes to data type. TA can also be used in approaches like ethnography and participatory approaches where there's a framework um, for doing the research, but there might not be um, a detailed framework for analyzing data. So because of TA's theoretical flexibility, it fits really comfortably in these approaches and is being widely used within these approaches. It's also common in pluralist designs where people use different analytic approaches to analyze the same data set and also in mixed method designs as well. When it comes to the size of your data set, TA can be used to look at both smaller and larger data sets. Um, as I said, it's being used in case study research where you have an N of one. This is not something that we anticipated when we first developed the approach, but it's something that people have innovated and developed TA to analyze these very small data sets. In terms of the constitution of the participant group, it works equally well with more homogeneous participant groups and more heterogeneous participant groups or data sets. So there's no particular requirements when it comes to what is known as an inverted commas sampling. TA can also be used to address most of the different types of quantitative research questions that researchers have. This can include questions about participants' lived experiences, their practices or behaviours, the things they do in the world, their sense making, so their views, understandings, perspectives and so on, but also questions about social processes, the factors that influence particular phenomena, the rules or norms that govern particular human practices or settings and contexts, and also more critical constructionist questions about the representation or construction of social objects in particular context. Where TA doesn't work is with questions about language practice because it doesn't have any tools or techniques for analysing the fine grained detail of language use. But this is where we see TA being mashed up with other approaches like narrative analysis and discourse analysis to be able to have both elements in the research, a focus on themes, but also a focus on the fine grained detail of language use. If you'd like to read more about um, conceptual and design thinking for TA, we've written a paper that addresses exactly this topic and it's in the list of references. TA also offers us a range of analytic possibilities and it's hard to kind of come up with labels for these in a way that doesn't sound sort of pejorative or judgmental, but we've decided or settled on more straightforward and more complex, but not implying that straightforward is necessarily bad or less good. So because TA doesn't have inbuilt theoretical assumptions, as I've already mentioned, it's sometimes assumed to be a theoretical and to be less sophisticated or to lack the interpretive power of other quanti qualitative analytic approaches than methodologies. But this really does represent a misunderstanding of TA. Theoretical flexibility is not the same as being a theoretical. So that assumption out of the way, more straightforward TA tends to be done in applied and practitioner contexts and experiential approaches fall into this camp, realist approaches fall into this camp. This is where TA is used to describe, to summarise, to give voice. We put interpretation in brackets here because even straightforward approaches to TA involve interpretation, that meaning isn't sort of self-evident in the data 
the researcher needs to do interpretive work in order to understand what the data mean. But not all analysis is interpretive in the sense that the focus is more on describing the data rather than focusing on what it means, what its significance is, what its importance and implications are. So this is where more complex approaches come in. This is where TA is used to tell a story about the data, to locate the data and the participants within wider social, cultural, historical, political and ideological contexts, where there's a focus on interpretation and telling the reader the significance of the data, the implications of the data, where the analysis might draw in theoretical and conceptual ideas. So this is where we would see more deductive approaches to TA, where theory is used as an interpretive lens to make sense of the data and where the analysis makes an argument. So there are these different ways in which TA can be used. And I don't want to suggest that one is better than the other. It's really hard to come up with terms that seem neutral. What's important is that how you use TA fits your purpose. So if your goal is to give voice to a group of participants, you take the more straightforward route. But if you're aiming to, to theorize, to locate data in a particular context, you'll probably take the more complex route. So we now call our approach reflexive TA to acknowledge its location within a qualitative paradigm and the central importance of the researcher in generating the analysis. And we're also calling it reflexive TA to signal that TA isn't just one singular method. There are lots of different approaches and ours falls in the reflexive camp. The theoretical flexibility of TA means that reflexivity is absolutely crucial to the successful implementation of the method. You're an active researcher, you're making choices and any researcher doing TA needs to actively make a series of choices as to what form of TA they're using and to understand and explain why they're using this particular form. To be able to do this, you need to be reflexive. Lots of things carry assumptions. Lots of processes and practices within qualitative research carry assumptions. And lots of theories carry assumptions too. So for example, if you're a psychologist like us, it can be tempting to see certain concepts from the social cognition tradition, like attitudes, beliefs, personality, body image, as common sense. But these are theoretically informed constructs. If you're using these, you're kind of importing these into your analysis. So it's really important to be wary of unacknowledged assumptions, unacknowledged theoretical assumptions. If you're using particular quality practices like member checking or triangulation, you need to be aware of the assumptions built into these. And this is something that we talk about when we get on to qualitative quality. So the goal for reflexive TA is to, using it, to use it knowingly and reflexively. And by knowingly, we mean deliberatively, consciously, striving to understand how theoretical assumptions, how your research values inform the practice to reflect on your positioning as a researcher, to reflect on how you're engaging with your data. So it's an active and a knowing process. So our second alert for this part is to emphasize the importance of using TA or striving to use TA knowingly and reflexively. We know that this is a journey, this is a process, that we're all learning and developing as researchers, but we're setting our intention, we're setting our goal to use TA knowingly and reflexively and to avoid unacknowledged assumptions creeping in to our use of TA and to our research. So we have a mega alert here, and it's to emphasize that themes don't passively emerge from data, that they're actively generated by the researcher in reflexive TA. This is why we're often associated with the saying themes don't emerge. This might sound silly or daft or trivial, but it's central to the underlying philosophy of reflexive TA. First, that the researcher, as I've said, is actively engaged in the theme generation process, but also that themes don't pre-exist the analysis. They're an output of the analysis, a product of the analysis, something that the researcher actively creates through their analytic and interpretive engagement with their data. So to end this part, I'm going to emphasize the importance of knowing practice, 
for doing quality TA, it's really important to understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And we think the metaphor of kind of discovery and artist are really helpful for thinking about what kind of researcher you want to be. Reflexive TA is a good fit for you if you think of yourselves as creative as an artist, as someone actively creating your analysis. But if you feel more comfortable in the discovery mode, then you're probably more comfortable with an approach like coding reliability or code TA that emphasise that discovery mode to analysis and research. Here are the references for part two. I hope you join me again for part three.